Today we're going to review for the quiz that's coming up on Thursday. So, um, I think we should start with that, give it as much time as is needed. And then we're going to look at the current chapter, chapter 11, which is on media operations. Sir, there's just a lieutenant sheet. So media operations would, would, if you ever were asking yourself what would it be like to work in a radio or a television station, media operations pretty much covers it. One, it's the, Nick actually shuts the door because in the recording you can hear outside. Never feel like you can't come in if the door is shut because it's always shut. I just saw the, the note on the door. Oh, the nor note about the photography department. I think, yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, as I say, the topic for this week, media operations, although, you know, we'll only sort of have half classes because we're going to review and then we'll have the test next class, but uh, it is good to get a sense of uh, what, what goes on in a radio or TV station, what kinds of occupations are there, and how, uh, how the different parts of a broadcaster fit together. And uh, the textbook covers also cable operations, which is something I'm less familiar with, but we can at least look into what it talks about. There. So uh, just, uh, I, I graded your, uh, um, your news, industry news presentations. It was a lot of fun to see you guys up talking about the things that we've actually, you know, been sort of studying in a general sense, seeing you talk very specifically. A little bit of research of my own that uh, I was uh, um, inspired to do this morning. I was listening to a podcast from The Verge, which is a, a technology website. And um, they mentioned there, they were talking about, you know, the Facebook scandal of, you know, selling users data, and uh, the huge breach of security. And somebody on was also saying, well, you know, this has been going on on television forever. Uh, so it's not really isolated to Facebook. And I was thinking, well, now why would they say that? You know, I know a lot about broadcast ratings and such. Uh, but as we know about broadcast ratings, they don't know down to, you know, your specifics, uh, what you're consuming and that type of thing. So, uh, um, just thought one of our students was at the door. So I was interested, intrigued. I looked this up uh, and quickly came to this story from the FTC, which remember is the Federal Trade Commission. So it's not the FCC, it's not the Communications Commission, but the Trade Commission, um, which penalized the television set manufacturer Vizio for collecting users' personal data. Uh, without letting them know, or at least without informing them adequately that that's what was going on. I was amazed by this. Did you guys, anyone, first of all, been shopping for a TV and seen Vizio out there? Yes, a few people? Yeah, it's not exactly Sony or whatever, but it's, it's you know, you've seen, yeah. And, and would, you, would you have thought that, uh, that this data collection is going on because First of all, I could understand how they do it, right? Because mass media, television, broadcasts to your house, right? But apparently, these are smart TVs, so they're connected to the internet. So uh, when you connect them to the internet, they can then beam back information about what you're watching. So that's... Even if we are watching, uh, like, uh, subscription platforms? That's right. How do they get into their data because that's exactly my question too and what they do actually is uh, they take samples of the pixels on the screen and those samples are matched up with database of the programs and stuff incredible wow. right so so it could come from a subscription platform like HBO it could come from over the airwaves right so it doesn't have to come to the TV through the smart TV connection through a network connection it can come from anywhere, and it recognizes the pixels off the screen, which is pretty, pretty incredible. So I didn't know that at all. And that, that's what they had mentioned in, in this podcast. I think the only thing is that they weren't right about is before smart TVs, this wouldn't have been possible, because there was no way to get the data from your TV to the 
to Visio, who aggregates it and then sells it. So, so in that way, they were, you know, kind of saying, "Well, it's always been like this. In fact, it's hardly ever been like this. It's just recently become like this." But I had I had no clue, you know. So the FTC, what they were, um, why they sued, you know, why they fined Visio for two million dollars, and required them to destroy all this data and stuff, was that. It, the way that customers were informed was pretty devious. Apparently, they were told that um, you know, uh, give us you know, accept this service because we will make program recommendations based on what we know about what you watch. So, uh, and in fact, they didn't even ever make any program recommendations. All they wanted you to do was to say yes to participate in this thing. Uh, what did they call it? smart interactivity setting, right? Uh, so they didn't they didn't say that in addition to monitoring all of your viewing habits in order to give you you know program recommendations they didn't say that it would also be used as uh, targeting, but in fact it would. So uh, um, you could. Uh, you could be watching a show, you know, your favorite show on, on Netflix or something or on anything, your favorite show, and start receiving advertising targeted to you based on that. You know, like, oh, new HBO special about such and such a thing. It would have come from that. These are the kinds of interesting little things you find out in, in, uh, in industry news. So uh, I thought that was cool. If you thought you were safe from tracking by using old media, well, not quite because um, as long as it's connected to the internet, then they can get your data that way. And, uh, so, so that's it. Um, and they direct people to various publications they have about you know, privacy and the current rules that exist. So that was kind of interesting to know that TVs as well can be you know, subject to the same kinds of, uh, of data monitoring that uh, social media open you up to. Uh, well, OK. So on Thursday, we have quiz two. I'm looking ahead to the end of the semester because we're getting there. Um, and so first of all, that was the wrong day for quiz two. <laughs> on Thursday, all these dates, are all these dates off a little bit? Isn't today the 16th? 17th. Today's the 17th? OK. So the 19th will be our, our quiz. Uh, today, we're reviewing for it. Uh, let's see, May 1st, I sort of shoot you an online discussion question regarding social media. And that has to be done within a week. And then after that, the last thing that uh, we're looking at is a term paper. Um, so um, we can discuss the assigned topics for a term paper, but also if you have any personal interests that you want to work on, you could talk to me about it and make sure it's okay with me, but we can, uh, you know, there's, there's five topics that are assigned. I can walk through them with you, and if you feel like you want to work on something else, that'd be okay, because it's been a long semester, and, but do try it out on me, and we'll, you know, see if we can uh, compromise on what you're interested in and what, what's appropriate for a final essay. Be happy to do that. Okay. Are you available now, or are we just now talking about this? We're going to start talking about it now. So it's due on May 15th, so it's like almost a month away, but it's a good idea to talk in advance. Cool. Okay, so today we're focusing in on reviewing for the quiz, and then um, I'll, you know, start off the topic of the week, which is industry operations. So I you know, made an announcement, which is the same as emailing everybody, I think, at the, just before the weekend or whatever about just sending out this resource, which is a kind of a, a compilation of the slides that, uh, these, these slides have the answers to the questions on the quiz on them. So that's why I sent them out. Uh, understanding that there's a hell of a lot of information that we're covering. So um, here they are. Uh, I hope you got the link, but if you didn't, the link is right here on the homepage of our site. Okay, so you can check that out. 
So I wanted to run through these with you pretty quickly, and they're up for you to look at them as much as you want before the quiz. So the quiz is on chapter 8, 9, and 10. There are 25 multiple choice questions. You've actually seen them on the cahoots before. Um, I'm not going to put the cahoots up this time, but I will before the final exam, which will contain some of these questions and other stuff that we're throwing in there and things. So this one's more your traditional um, memorize, uh, memorize the information uh, stuff. So you'll see in red the, uh, the information that is important to remember for the quiz. Okay? So um, chapter 8 was regarding ratings, you know, understanding audiences in the way that we used to understand them. Now I realize that with smart TVs, there's all kinds of interesting developments happening on that level. But so, you know, uh, first of all, we talked about the history of all this. The early rating systems, which were conducted by phoning people at home, right? So the telephone recall system was uh, the, the first method that was used. And of course, some of the weaknesses of that was that people might not recall all that well uh, what it was that um, they had been listening. And um, <clears throat> Nielsen, the company that's still with us, uh, doing the television and radio ratings now, uh, their first innovation was what they called the audimeter, which was a mechanical device that went into a radio and uh, allowed Nielsen to track what station you actually had tuned to at a particular time. So uh, that's the Audi, Audi standing for maybe audio, maybe audience, but that's the audimeter. We'll see that there are slight differences between radio and television and between the major markets, like the largest markets in the US and the smaller markets. Remember, every uh, geographical area is divided up for broadcast purposes into designated market areas. Remember DMAs? And so there's over 200 in the United States. And uh, the biggest ones, which have large population, affluent population, like the Bay Area, for instance, uh, will be using uh, a, uh, the, the people meter device. These uh, replace what is still available in all of the smaller markets, which is diary reporting. Um, so that's an example of a diary there where you have to write in you know, what station you were listening to, where you were, were you at home, office, car, whatever, and the day part and stuff. So as we said, the diary also suffers from the recall problem. And also, you may not know all the stations that you were listening to. So in the larger markets, the portable people meter has been introduced. Remember, it's a, it's a little electronic device, um, smaller than a cell phone that actually listens to codes that are um, uh, put out on the, uh, mixed in with the audio of the songs that you're listening to. The ratings are done on a national level four times a year. It's what's called a sweeps period. So the sweeps happen in November, February, May, and July. And at that time, Nielsen uh, puts in extra resources into uh, covering the viewing habits of the entire country instead of just the local markets. Uh, that's really important for television broadcasters uh, because they want to know, for instance, the sweeps in May happen just before the upfronts where they sell all the advertising. So the sweeps help the networks establish you know, uh, their advertising rates by giving us an idea of who's listening to what. Okay. So a slight variation between radio listening and television listening. Um, because radio uh, audiences tend to change channels more often than tele television does and stay on a channel for a sort of short period of time instead of for an entire half hour segment, radio measures in terms of AQH, so average quarter hour. Um, so what they want to know is how many listeners, on average, were there in a 15-minute segment. That means the listeners could leave this, come back, leave, bounce around, and they'll get counted in that way. So that's called AQH. And this is for radio. T 
TV is going to be measured uh, on the program segment. And um, this is where we should get into the distinction between a rating and a share, right? The rating is the estimate of people tuned in divided by the number of people who own a TV radio set. So let's take a really simple example. Let's, let's say 10 people tuned in at a tiny market that has only 100 people with radio or television sets, right? And so your rating would turn out to be 10% in this case. So this would be the, the number of people who were, um, you know, they call it either HUT, households using television, or radio listeners. And down here, so that's what this is, down here is your universe, your total number who are listening, right? So this is rating. And now you remember share is a little different, right? So share typically has a smaller denominator than rating because share, this is only the number of households with TV on, okay? So um, it'll be less because in any given night, not everybody's watching TV. So you might have a universe of 100 sets, but in this night, in this case, only 50 people were actually watching. Only 50 households had the TV on, so then 10 over 50 would give you a 20% share. Even though it's the same number of individual households who are actually listening or watching, but the way you calculate it is a little different. The universe is uh, what we use for rating, and uh, this is just the number of households that have the TV or radio on. So, any questions about this? Are we good to move on with this? It's not, uh, the, any, any question I ask you about it will have easy math but you just need to remember the difference of how rating is calculated versus share. So if I was gonna write a question about this, you know, I might say, you know, like, uh, 10 households were watching the Big Bang Theory uh, in a community with 100 households that had television. So that would tell you that the universe is 100 households with TV, right? But whereas I would ask, so then I would say, what is the rating? So you'd know it will be 10 over 100, right? But then if I asked you, you know, well, 10 households have uh, watching the Big Bang Theory, uh, and they live in a community with 100 TV sets, but that night only 50 were watching, uh, were actually having to, had the TV on. So then you'd be confused as, well, should I go with 100? Should I go with 50? And that's when you need to know that share refers to those who are actually watching. Okay. Questions? Are there more questions? <laughs> the more I explain, the, would there be questions? No. Okay, that's encouraging. The more I explain, there is yes. Um, isn't it more uh, useful to use the the one with like people who actually have a TV on versus people who own televisions? Uh, it depends on what you want to find out. But uh, yeah, I think as a measure of how well you're doing against all the other broadcasters, I think you're right, you know? It makes more sense, as you said, this is share. So your question was, doesn't it make more sense to measure share than rating? And I think if what you want to find out is how you're doing against everyone who's watching TV, then I think, yeah, because share lets you know that you've got 20% of the audience on any given night, right? But then maybe if you wanted to know, well, how is this program doing versus, you know, uh, the everybody's options, you know, yeah. any media that they could be watching, or they could be reading the newspaper, or they could be out for a walk or whatever, then, then versus rating. The rest, that's like versus the rest of the world. That's versus other shows. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, so here you're counting against all the people who are watching. Here you're counting, you know, just everybody who's there, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, and so, uh, you know, again, for broadcasting, as you know, less and less people tune into CBS, the ratings go down and down and down and down, right? Versus share, even if 
you know, less and less people are tuning in, all we're counting is the percentage of the people who actually are tuning in. So share starts to look better and better and better versus rating, you know, because rating, it just, it's dropped through the floor, whereas share, it's still okay. You know? so, so I think uh, broadcasters share, you know, they, they have your idea too, that share is probably, it makes them sound better anyway. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good question. All right, another, another, boy, this is, this is definitely the week for concepts of measurement. Um, this one here is important. Cost per thousand, or CPM, M stands for mil. So this is a, a quick calculation that allows you to compare the cost of a spot or a bunch of spots versus the cost of, let's say, a print ad or some digital advertising or something like that. So what you would have there is, you know, uh, if it costs you, I don't know, $10,000 to put a commercial up on Fox News or something like that, you know, then, and, and, and you reached 10,000 people who happen to be watching at that point, you know, the cost per mill is, is uh, $10, $10, right? Um, so it's really just how much did it cost to reach 1,000 people? So just remember that, CPM. You know, I typically don't ask for any calculation or stuff like that. As you see, there's a bunch of other ways that things are calculated, but I think you'd want to be in a, a, a more advanced course in television or media programming which they have at San Francisco State, by the way. Okay, uh, so still always on the business side of things. Um, we're talking about pricing for getting your spots on the air. And uh, there are a bunch of different um, ways that uh, you can get you know, discounts or bundles of, of spots. Uh, you pay for them that way usually. Nobody pays them for them one at a time. Uh, but two interesting concepts that we came up which help stations save money uh, is number one, bartering, which is also called trade out, a trade out or a bartering agreement. So what that is, is when part or all of the cost for some advertising is paid for in services. So. It might be that you, um, you know, enter into a kind of a promotional partnership with, a, I don't know, Red Bull or something like that, so that um, you know they will provide some product or support at an event that you're doing, and you will provide airtime. So that's a bartering agreement, for instance. Um, sometimes you're you're trading stuff. Uh, you can also barter spots themselves. So. You know, it's instead of um, paying for some programs from a syndicator, you can give a little bit of cash and then say, and you can also have all of these advertising spots in my programming. So that's another way of bartering. So you're not paying cash, you're trading something of value. And as a station, what you can trade is airtime for spots. So that's a bartering agreement. Uh, the co-op or cooperative advertising is when part of the cost of the advertising run is paid for by the manufacturer, for instance. So that would be, uh, you know, if, um, if an electronics manufacturer um, went and, you know, paid part of the cost of a retailer who's selling their devices. So I don't know, you, you got a phone, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the the retail shops are selling the phone, but half of the advertising is paid for by the phone manufacturer and the other half by the retail shop. So that would be a co-op where they cooperate together. So any questions about that? When I explain it, it's really pretty clear, right? So, so bartering, we all know about that. It's like trading something. And then cooperative, that might be a little more difficult to remember, but just remember it's the manufacturer who pays part of the advertising. All right, and then we talked about, uh, you know, digital technologies and the different ways that um, 
advertising costs are computed in digital. So just take a look at these. I don't know, should we run through them briefly? Hits. So this is where they count the page views that are actually on the assumption that somebody who clicks to the page will see the ad. Um, not very reliable because you know, not, not just humans are clicking on pages. There are you know, software that goes running through a lot of pages for different reasons. You wind up paying for that. So then uh, something that it requires more interaction, maybe a little bit more reliable, is cost per click, CPC. So when someone clicks on a banner ad that appears on a website, we all do it, maybe accidentally even, uh, then they uh, pay per click. So that also could be kind of falsified. Um, and so then you get into something that's a lot less common, cost per transaction, where the advertiser only pays when somebody actually buys something. And that's it. Uh, cost per impression. Uh, again, simply relates to did they see the ad or not. So that's closely related to CPM. So those are, those are the ways that, you know, in digital, either the hits on a page, cost per click as people click through, cost per transaction if they buy something, which is much more rare. So that should be pretty good. Okay, that's all you need to remember from Chapter 8, and that's the most tricky chapter, I'd say, because of its... Uh, some of the calculation and the concepts of audience measurement that are out there. All right, let's look through to chapter nine, which had a lot of observations about social media, I'd say. So who would have thought Friendster, the first of the social networking sites? Um, Facebook being the one that uh, was initially focused on um, schools and education you know, moved out into the general population and now has a user base of billions, the largest uh, ad network after Google. So that's where its value is coming from, all of those advertisers. Dominant in US and globally, where people spend a ridiculous amount of time, apparently. Um, oh yeah, okay, remember about Google Plus? So this would be described as, uh, you know, a social media uh, overlay over all of Google's services. So any Google service that you might sign up for, Gmail or something like that, would get you into Google+, Plus, which did not do very well. Nobody seemed to really want to go to it. LinkedIn we talked about, so social networking for professionals. As you can see, it's all pretty generalized, okay. Um, a topic that follows on in our interest of news and about social media, and you could actually even write a research essay about this if you want at the end of class. It's one of our um, chosen topics. So citizen journalism, uh, this is the, uh, the growing ability of individuals through social media to publish and to publish you know, material which uh, uh, is fact-based, journalistic stuff. Um, but as we've seen, the downside of it is that you can't always trust it. So it requires a more sophisticated audience who you know, can uh, distinguish between fact and opinion. And that's not always easy, even for a sophisticated audience like you guys. We, we can easily get fooled. So um, this is in journalism. Uh, we looked at a little bit of research about social media. And uh, one of the concerns that uh, many people have, which is that it's taking up so much time, uh, it may even be kind of intervening between our, our non-mediated relationships, our face-to-face -face friendships and such. The resulting impact on relationships, loneliness, but also ambient awareness. So that's the idea of, you know, constantly knowing a little bit about the people that you know, but uh, you know, the textbook describes it as being alone together. 
there's a lot of people kind of on your periphery that you know a little bit about, but you don't necessarily know. Uh, you don't you don't get the the psychological and social benefits of actually interacting with people, which are huge. Um, so that's ambient awareness. Is everyone good on that? When we get into review mode, sometimes I just like plow ahead because I feel that everyone's bored. <laughs> okay. Yeah, been here. All right. Well. If you if you do have more questions, just like jump in. I don't want to run over any ideas. Ambient awareness likely to intensify. We spend more time on it. Well, that was it on chapter nine, social media. That wasn't that bad. If you remember those sort of summaries, you'll be good. And then chapter ten, the business of media ownership. There's a number of places in the textbook. Even today, there's you know in in uh, the chapter we're looking at today, there's um, a review of sort of business models. Um, so, you know, the early business model of toll broadcasting, where you would kind of rent your channel over to an advertiser, which in today's language would be like infomercials, where you just let them put on their show, a half hour ad or something like that. So that would have been part of the toll broadcasting model where you know, you've know you got the channel and you charge people per minute to use the channel. You know? So that's supposed to be infomercials. Uh, then we had the sponsorship model where you would uh, turn over all of the advertising rights to your channel for a given period of time to a single sponsor. So that would be the, you know, the, the Craft Radio Hour or something like that. So they would brand it with their name. And, and in the early days, they actually produced the show. They put up money to produce the show, hired the celebrity actors and such. Um, so sponsorship model was good for a while. Um, broadcasters found out that they could make more money by using spots. Uh, but sponsorship occasionally comes back as, uh, for instance, online advertisers take over you know, an entire website for a day or the, the you know, space of an event. Um, they buy all the advertising on Twitch or something like that for 48 hours or something like that, and they blitz. You know. So you still get that a little bit. Uh, OK, let's jump on to uh, the report on chain broadcasting, which you will remember the big outcome was that it forced NBC to split itself up because uh, it was deemed too powerful uh, compared to the only other competitor was CBS. So NBC, which uh, had basically historically grown up as two parts, the red network and the blue network, and the colors were associated actually with the AT&T long distance lines that were used to distribute the programming from each radio station to another. That's why they were called the red and the blue. Uh, so they had to sell the blue because Congress uh, required them to do it in the report on chain broadcasting. And that's what produced you know, ABC. And in the aftermath of the Facebook, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg was before Congress testifying, and some of the you know uh, people questioning him were going, "Well, you know, who are your competitors? I mean, Facebook is so gigantic. You know, it's basically there are no competitors. You can go nowhere else. So, you know, what does that mean? That might mean that uh, uh, Facebook might be broken up at some point. Who knows? Uh, maybe not here, but maybe in another country, which is more." proactive about this. All right, cool. Here's the broadcast star model. Uh, so you should know what's in the model. And uh, it's an attempt just to be you know, comprehensive about who's, who's involved in TV broadcasting, the stations, the program suppliers, which could be the networks or the syndicators, the regulators, which you know, are in charge of uh, you know, renewing the licenses for those stations, and they also look at content eventually. The advertisers who pay for all of this by buying time on the stations or by placing products in the programs. And then audiences who are there to consume the stuff. So that's uh, the broadcast star model. So do remember that. 
So it just gives us a picture of everybody involved. Ownership of broadcast stations, right? So uh, one thing that we said, since the FCC licenses stations um, to, you've got to be an American citizen, you can't be a convicted felon. Um, and more and more, they, because there are so many people who are uh, requesting licenses and few terrestrial broadcast frequencies anymore to license away, they'll um, sell them at auction. Who can, who can come up with the most money? Um, okay, we looked at the distinction between owning and operating a broadcast station. So, uh, you know, um, there are a few variations there. We told the story of Cron, which um, had been a privately owned affiliate of a network. So that is one type of relationship you can have where the owner simply affiliates with a network. Um, there's something com you know, currently called owned and operated, which is where, let's say, NBC would have wanted to buy Cron but eventually the de Young family sold Cron to somebody else, which brought about its, its you know, continuing troubles, basically. Uh, but owning and operating is by, by a network is, is another possibility. Okay. Uh, down uh, the more rare occurrences, um, so some stations are not operated by the company that owns them. They may buy a station, but not want to, you know, get a whole management team and everything that's required because that costs a lot of money. Uh, so in smaller markets, it's possible to come to a local marketing agreement, the LMA. So what, what that means basically is uh, you own a station and somebody else owns a station, but you allow them to operate your station at the same time. So there's that, the marketing agreement. And then Something related is what if one licensee owns two or more stations, so that's called a duopoly. And that's sort of rare because uh, typically in TV, you're not allowed to own uh, more than one of the top four stations in a market. So you could own the CBS affiliate, but you're not allowed to own that and the NBC affiliate. You could own the CBS affiliate and some independent station lower down that doesn't work with a network because it's a smaller station. But uh, it's, a, it's a rare occasion where you can actually have two. So that's called duopoly because of, because of the restrictions on, on ownership. So duopoly is one li license owns two broadcasts? Yeah, okay. two, and, and it would be two. These it, We're really talking about TV stations. OK. Stations. Because in radio, the rules are you could have up to eight. In a big market like ours, Clear Channel could have eight. But duopoly, you know, there's monopoly where you own one, everything. <laughs> duopoly is where you can own two, two things. So remember that that way. And uh, then we talked about, you know, some of the, uh, some of the dangers to station ownership uh, is that you could get sued, uh, especially if, you know, you... Uh, say something controversial or potentially untrue about a, a person's reputation. So remember, we distinguish between libel, which is uh, an attack on someone's reputation in print, and then slander, where it's said, you know, so your anchor person says something. Um, and, you know, this has to be false. First of all, if it's true, there's no way they can sue you and win. Um, so it has to be false, and it also there's, you know, it has to be demonstrated that you willfully set out to say something that wasn't true, and that would be harmful to their reputation. Is uh, the responsibility of the, like, of the anchor or of the? Uh, well, the anchor as an employee of the station would be the station would be sued, basically. And the anchor has no responsibility. Well, I'm not sure about that. They might include both. I'm not sure because you know some of these anchors are very wealthy individuals as well. You know they make twenty million dollars a year if they're on Fox News. Another thing is that there's a different um, a different set of standards for public figures, politicians, you know, entertainment celebrities and stuff like that. Um, so it's uh, they have 
you know, for instance, they can't, they can't claim you've invaded their privacy because they put themselves out there in public for, you know, consumption. Okay, uh, we're almost at the end here. I'm sure you're happy. Consolidation has made the market increasingly oligopolistic. So consolidation meaning that, uh, you know, there are fewer and fewer companies engaging in the business of broadcasting because they buy each other up. So that's consolidation, where you, you know, you, one company buys more and more companies, gets bigger. Um, and so this leads to what they call oligopoly or an oligopolistic market, meaning there are only a few players who actually own everything. So we saw, we looked at, you know, the five largest um, conglomerate media companies, Disney being like the, the most impressive, I guess, because it owns so much and, and what it owns is, you know, so, so culturally important, you know, Lucasfilms and Pixar and ESPN and so on. So. Ah, okay. Oh my God, we're not finished yet, right? So there's two here. Uh, first of all, regarding um, the cable business. Um, well, no, actually, this is, this is the relationship between a network and its affiliate. Um, so if the network owns and operates a station, that's the end of it. You know, they're basically providing programming to their own station. No money needs to change hands. But if the local station is an affiliate of the network, the local station is privately owned by somebody else, then uh, a uh, compensation agreement goes into effect, which is, you know, typically to be the NBC affiliate. For most of the history of broadcasting, NBC would have written you a check. You know, in addition to being able to make money from advertising, you would also make money because the network would compensate you. Um, but as we said, we're in a position now where we're seeing reverse compensation, where the network demands money from the local affiliate because it's so expensive to produce all the programming, that, especially sports programming, that goes to local affiliates. They demand reverse compensation. So the old way was the network pays the station. Thank you very much for showing everything that we've created. And the new way is the network says, if you want to show our stuff, you got to pay us because it costs us so much to produce it. You know, we want you to pay as well. So that's reverse compensation. And uh, just the, a note, the final note here, consolidation will continue in radio, creating an oligopolistic industry. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of this in print as well as in radio, where uh, big companies buy up small stations, uh, you know, again, that consolidation is creating really big station ownership groups with hundreds of stations. Clear Channel had thousands of stations at one point, a thousand more than the other players have in the two, three, four hundreds. So that's a lot of small businesses which are now bought up and controlled by, you know, a few um, large players. So that's the story of our population. So there you go. That's it. These slides are up there. So I suggest you go through them again before the quiz, just looking at the red, the, the red lines there. And um, any questions about anything that we need to clarify again? Cool. Well, that was dull, but it will impact your bottom line. So that's OK, <laughs> I guess. Fair compensation for being bored is getting a good grade. All right, let's take a look then, uh, because we have a whole chapter for this week, but uh, it's not gonna, we're not gonna dip into it um, deep, deep, deep. Um, yeah, media operations. So as we said, uh, this is related to how, does, how, do, uh, how do media companies work? How do they operate? What's it like being in one? Um, so our textbook breaks down, you know, six basic functions that go on in a radio station or a TV station. And uh, so, you know, there'd be management, engineering, it's 
go on further, production, programming, and sales and promotions, okay? So I don't want to spend an enormous amount of time ticking through all the different things that are going on here. Like any business, a TV station or a radio station needs management, you know, just to oversee, as you can see, hiring people, making sure they're treated right, there'll be HR, it's got a building, someone has to take care of the building, make sure it works, you know, and so there's people involved in that. That would be the same in any business, right? But because it's broadcasting, there's also a very few, you know, it's a small community of broadcast engineers who work in local stations, making sure that, you know, um, both the internal equipment, like all the production equipment is working right, and then they also are responsible for overseeing, you know, the, the actual broadcast part about it, making sure that signals are not too strong, so on and so forth. The quality of the signal is good because if it's bad, people will just stop tuning in, right? Uh, however, these are people with, you know, uh, engineering degrees in uh, electronic engineering and, and uh, IT. They've got to have, you know, plenty of those skills now too. So uh, um, this is a, a very specialized position. We don't have classes at City College for us to teach this. Uh, you'd have to go to, you know, a few, one of the few engineering institutes that, that teach this type of stuff in the country. So that's maybe not your first choice for career. Uh, production, there's um, plenty of production that goes on in local stations. In radio stations, it might just be more like spots and uh, live remotes. So, you know, if you, if you go out, um, the promotions people have, you know, a deal with sleep train or something is Saturday they're hey come on down our DJs are broadcasting live from sleep train you know you can get in the big bed with everybody and be on the air and so you know that kind of thing has to be produced so there's stuff like that um, and uh, I wanted to get okay programming and staff uh, let's get to this sales and promotions because this is where there's a lot of openings in broadcasting and uh, where um, a lot of money is actually made still. Um, so even as production staff like DJ is being cut down, there's less, less uh, uh, openings there. Um, although I wouldn't be totally discouraged. It's like, not like there's nothing. But in sales and promotions, the radio stations continue to go like 100%. Uh, because you know these are these are the money producers in a station so you're generally uh, as a successful salesperson or working on the promotions team uh, you're regarded uh, as as bringing in the money so you get a certain amount of respect versus uh, you know people in the production end are, are just cost you have to pay them and they don't directly bring you any money so sales is uh, um, an interesting thing, it can be challenging, but it's among the best paid positions in broadcasting. Uh, and people don't usually think about it as an option when they're just going into broadcasting. Or I want to make radio shows, or I want to make TV shows. But you can actually make more money in sales. So I wanted to point that out. It can be difficult because there's a lot of rejection in sales, just like in any other kind of job selling there's a lot of no's before there are you know yeses um, so uh, i knew three people from my radio classes over at san francisco state who went out in in various ways either one of them worked in promotions and two of them worked in sales and uh, i mean some have gone on to be board ops and uh, one of them is a kmbr host um, so there's there's jobs also on the production side but in sales, um, they used to tell me a lot of interesting things about being sales people. So the way it works is when you get a job in sales, and there are usually a lot of openings because people come and go, uh, because you know it doesn't work out for everybody. Uh, so you'll get into a station in a position in sales, and for about three months, there's usually a small salary, like. Uh, you know, it would probably come to something like 20000 for the years. It's not a lot of money. But it's something to get you up and going. 
And uh, uh, then after three months, you're expected to start providing for yourself through commissions from what you're selling. So that's a bit of a challenge already. You have a pretty short time to get going. They will give you lists of contacts that are usually, you know, people, companies that have advertised before. And, you know, your job is to go and see if you can get them back. And sometimes the lists are old and they don't, there's not even a company like that anymore. So you spend some time in the first three months, you know, bringing these lists back to life and adding in everybody from friends and family to, uh, uh, to businesses. You're walking down the street, hey, that, sh that might be a good place to advertise, you know, stop in and just say hi and maybe give them some of your literature or something and then call them back in a week or something like that. So, so uh, there's a lot of prospecting for clients and there are also, you know, businesses which sell lists and stuff. And so your, your, your broadcaster may have access to that. So there's a lot of that prospecting for clients, you know. Um, they, uh, okay, well, there's, how much do they go into this? I mean, a little later on. I just want to see if there's more described here. Um, well, oh, that's specific, right? Well, let's talk um, radio specifically. Radio is a much more local business, and so there's a lot more opportunity for going out and getting advertising clients, restaurants, you know, other businesses around you versus TV, which is more national in scope. It's more expensive. Uh, you'll still get restaurants, but, you know, maybe later at night, stuff like that. So um, in, in, uh, in the radio station, there's a sales associates, which if you enter in, you'll be one of those. And you're in your cubicle. You have to wear business clothes. You never know when you might have to go out and actually meet a client and you know give them literature or propose some advertising spots to them. So you have to look business all the time, even if you're there calling for the whole week trying to get somewhere to get something going. Um, there is a sales, uh, so you got your account executives doing that. You've got uh, the sales manager, uh, who's you know your boss in sales. And so the sales manager is, uh, first of all, overseeing all the account executives, uh, also producing all of the materials that the account executives have, like the price lists and uh, you know, uh, uh, the promotional material for the station, like why should you advertise with us? So the sales manager needs to know, you know about marketing. Uh, they need to produce those materials. They need to know about ratings and such so that they can come up with the, you know, the kinds of arguments which will say, hey, advertise with us. We're the best at this. You know? um, so the sales manager also can, can often be like the closer. Like as an account executive, you may you know, bring the relationship with an advertiser a certain length. You know, well, I've got this car dealership. They want you know, 10 weeks of this many spots. And the sales manager will come and, and you know close off the deal and sign all the paperwork and make sure that's all ironed out. You know? Now the sales manager is making a commission plus a nice salary, so they're doing really well. And as I said, your account executives are um, are struggling sometimes. Um, so as you you know progress, you get you get regular clients who sometimes all you have to do is pick up the phones and say, what do you want? They tell you, boom, it's done. You didn't even have to go see them, and you're making thousands of dollars a month that way. So it's, it's really good if you get you know, steady clients who are buying spots all the time. And the senior ad executives uh, make in the hundreds of thousands of dollars doing that uh, versus DJs who are you know, probably under 100,000, especially starting. Uh, if you're if you're a you know celebrity morning host, you might make several hundred thousand dollars as well. But uh, um, the 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 pathway to that kind of earning is is uh, is longer than it would be for sales. So sales is often the quickest path to upper management as well. Typically, management in in broadcasting comes out of sales because they're regarded as the people who really understand the business. 
versus the creative side, which they're regarded as sort of crazy artists who can, you know, get people interested, but uh, they can't necessarily make the business work right. So that's another thing about sales, which is interesting. Um, and closely related is the promotions department. So this is another place where if you want to get into radio, uh, there are always openings. Again, you might be working for free. Uh, you know, as, as, a, as a starting account executive, you've like got a little salary and then you're hoping for commissions. In promotions, the way in is very often, it's like, I want to be a part of this. You know, uh, what can I do to get involved in the station? Uh, they look you over. Do you look like a sort of normal person? <laughs> you know, yes. Okay, come and help us on the street team. Uh, you know, so, and, you know, television stations and radio stations are constantly promoting themselves, you know. And so you'll go out and, uh, and, and just meet people, hand stuff out, things like that. Can you guys remember ever encountering a street team or stuff? Were they giving out merchandise or what they, what they were doing for you? Andrea? They were giving out like stickers and stuff. And like, they also would let you request a song. So like they would have spots for like Thursday, Friday or whatever. And then like they would let you put a song and they're like, oh, like, okay, tune in on that day and you'll hear your song. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And, and what event did you see them at? Do you remember? Well, it wasn't an event. They would just like be set up like at parking lots, oh, okay. like by grocery stores, like big grocery stores. Okay. Like in San Diego, like they just set up and they have like a little like, canopy. And, yeah. They just have, so they kind of make their own event. Yeah. Okay, that's little, interesting. Little that's interesting. <laughs> we had them at the health center, like here, every year the health center has kind of like an open house just to show everybody all the things that they do for you. And, uh, and we had, you know, I can't remember which two local stations came and just set up and played music and, you know, hand out their stuff. And, you know, so it's, it's good for them to promote themselves. Okay. Anybody else seen any promotional stuff? There's also, you know, crazy stories about DJs, you know, blocking the Golden Gate Bridge. I think it was Chewy Gomez blocked the Golden Gate Bridge, or maybe he was working for somebody who did. So they got fined for that. So some, some crazy kinds of stunts that I haven't heard of recently, but uh, where they just try to attract attention to the, to the station. You know, the idea of promotions in a station is it's since, you know, you're trying to reach out to other audiences, like you have your core audience that knows, you know, your KNBR, they love you, they love what you do. So you, you want to keep them faithful and keep them happy. But you also want to expand your, your audience, you know. And so part of what promotions does is to just get, get the name of the station out there, you know, just set up and give stuff away and get people thinking, oh, wow, hey, I want to listen to that station. You know? So that's important. So they'll do crazy stuff. Like uh, one station had this on-air competition. Again, they got fined for that. <laughs> All these really crazy things. So they had a fake competition. And uh, they said, uh, uh, we're giving away free breasts, uh, you know, the fifth caller or something like that. So people call in and they thought they were getting plastic surgery, but then they got a bucket of fried chicken. And I was like, gosh. So that was that, right? So they got fined for that because when you have a competition, it actually has to be a real competition that gives what it is that you say you're giving away. Um, and this relates back to those quiz show scandals in the 1950s where they were, you know, Turned out they were giving answers to people, on, you know, to, and so this, there's a lot of rules around competitions and stuff. And one of them is that it really has to do what it says it's going to do. Um, so, so, you know, there's that aspect where you're promoting the station, getting people to know. It. And then the other thing is, you, you know, just being a part of the community. You're there during blood drives. You're there doing promotions and stuff like that. So, so those, are, um, those are fun activities. The people in promotions at the station always have tickets to give away. They always have stuff to, to help you out. So, so they're usually very popular people at a station, too. 
So uh, that's promotions. And there's usually a way into getting work in a station that way. Uh, you know, you, they see you can work hard, so then they might find you a paid job on the inside, either working with them or, you know, something else. And you get to know everybody. That's a good way in. Oh, yeah, yeah. I sense that we have reached our limit for the day. So let's, um, let's call it a day. Next class is the quiz. So remember, you can take it online or you can take it here in class. Um, in, if you take it online, it has to be during the class period. Yeah. Right? Okay. So we're good. Good luck on a quiz. We'll see you next class.